Hello, everybody. Welcome along. It's going to be a breaking news video this morning because last night saw the sacking of two championship managers within hours of one another. First, Mike Duff was announced as being sacked as Swansea manager. Secondly, Tony Mowbray stacked as Sunderland manager. Just incredible to get my head around. Happened fairly late at night. I thought I'd be setting up and prepping to just talk about Duff at Swansea. But then the Mowbray news broke afterwards. So you guys seem to prefer it on the breaking news stuff. If I do go off the cuff and we get a bit more of a um, visceral, emotional uh, reaction to me, particularly from these manager sacking videos, get your views down there in the comments. And what I always say, please, on these um, sackings videos, this is not goals and assists and things happening on the pitch. This is people's careers and people's livelihoods. So if I can just pray, exercise any kind of empathy for a fellow human being who's just lost a job ahead of um, whatever point you want to make about how your football club is doing. Freedom of speech, though, ahoy. Do say what you want down there in the Comments. Um, just before we get into um, the two managerial departures, I will say we said for years on the channel here that um, October international break is the quote managerial graveyard. That did appear to be the case. I can't remember all the all the names that went. I think it was Cisco Munoz at Sheffield Wednesday, John Eustace at Birmingham, Rowett went. Was that? I kind of remember if um, there was another one in that. We'll bring the table up and have a look properly. But it all seems to be now just proximity to the January transfer window, doesn't it? We've just come back from an international break. We've had a three-game week. We've got one week's gap now, another three-game week, and then it's pretty much Christmas and transfer window opening. And two separate clubs have decided to get shot of their managers. Look, if you want to hear about Mike Duff, I'll put chapters in at the bottom so you can click on now. But we will start by talking about Tony Mowbray, who is out of Sunderland. Uh, Mowbray, remember, came in at the start of last season. Sunderland had just been promoted from League One under Alex Neal, who decided a, a better gig for him would be to manage Stoke City. You can have your views on uh, that decision, how that's currently working out. Mowbray was brought in, I don't know, is it fair to call him just a safe, experienced championship pair of hands? He'd been doing the Blackburn job, been around obviously for years and years, going back to working for West Brom and getting promotions back. Um, he got one in 2008. Did he maybe go up twice at West Brom? I can't quite uh, remember. Anyway, He's been around years and years, played quite nice open football at um, Blackburn. And what we need to consider with Sunderland is this kind of project they've got of um, trading quite freely in terms of buying and selling, happy to sell um, and bringing in lots and lots of young players. In fact, pretty much exclusively young players and plenty from the European market. That's the model they've gone with. Here is the statement on the Sunderland website. I won't read it all. As always, I try and highlight the actual pithy bit because a lot of these statements are just uh, bluff and don't really say anything. Uh, so this is Sporting Director Christian Speakman. Uh, this was a difficult decision to make, but we remain loyal to our ambition and our strategy and felt that now was the right moment to take this step. I don't know publicly what the fine details of that strategy is. Does that mean a manager who, like a lot of their players, is a lot younger and uh, to develop that way? Or do you need an older manager when you're working with a lot of younger players? I don't know myself. There was a lot of rumours immediately after the playoff semifinals last season. I remember literally the day after Sunderland had lost to Luton. I was at the game at Kenilworth. Road, um, there are a lot of um rumors that Tony Mowbray was going to be out then. I don't know if there was no smoke without fire then, but it does seem that um, I don't know how to word this, but um, 
maybe a maybe a look ahead of Mowbray the whole time that was he a placeholder? I don't know how fair that is, but uh, you tell me. And I suppose the issue is if we bring up the historic tables there for Sunderland, obviously, if you go right back, you can see that horrible double relegation as Ellis Short basically pulled all the money out and uh, Sunderland actually managed to get relegated, finishing bottom with a year one parachute payment, which is always a good example of uh, the parachute payments are only an advantage if you spend them. You can see what happens if a relegated club doesn't have them um, straight through. Four years then in League One, Alex Neal takes them from um, League One to the Championship via the playoffs. And then you almost get this situation where, and I say this a lot on the channel, if your club wants to move up the pyramid, you are far, far better off than doing it gradually. Obviously, everyone loves a massive jump from the League One playoffs straight into the Championship playoffs. But sustainable growth is far more manageable in any walk of life and economically and you know i'm sure you can give hundreds of examples um than a massive quick jump and there's almost a sense that if sunderland had got promoted and finished 12th and in the top half with then time to build that um things maybe would be different but they didn't as you can see there they jumped straight into the top six and um, playoffs from one from League One straight into the championship. And I think I did the numbers on this. It's quite unprecedented. I don't know what Ipswich are doing this season in terms of being in the top two nearly at the halfway point. But generally, I think I looked and it was like one in eight years that had finished in the top half, let alone in the playoffs. So it was an outlandish success, an outlier. I know there's an argument that Sunderland in a crowded championship mid-table shot out of it and into the playoffs. But they did what they did and they finished in there. And that uh, success, again, some people argued that it was one incredible loan signing with Ahmad Diallo. And yeah, he was a great influence on that team last season. But we know Sunderland have traded well and, um, you know, sort of the likes of Jack Clark that are now going to be huge deals off the rank. We saw Ross Stewart go out um, in the summer to Southampton as well. So I said, they're prepared to sell. And I guess that would take us to this season and what the expectations are and going forward. If I um, bring up the most recent kind of bit of data I've got on this, you can see Sunderland are ninth in the table. They are three points off the playoffs. In the eight-game form table, okay, is survival form. It's eight points from the last eight. But uh, Tony Mowbray leaves Sunderland um, if someone can basically get a bit of an uptick with the potential to be in the playoffs once again. Yes, if we look at the minutiae of the championship this season and not specifically Sunderland, you could argue the top four with three parachute teams and Ipswich, a year one parachute teams, in fact, and Ipswich on a massive total already means the top four are unlikely to finish out the top six. West Brom are playing well. Corbron's got them moving. And if there's no financial meltdown there, but I was looking at it, Hull, Middlesbrough, Sunderland, maybe the favourites for um, that one extra playoff spot. Sunderland are always a bit of an outlier as well when it comes to the championship because they've got such a giant fan base, a little bit like Leeds, I guess. And we've had Aston Villa and Nottingham Forest and the like also find their way up into the Premier League. Not a normal championship team that's drawing attendances of sort of 40,000. Now, there's going to be a lot of people, and it is their right to do so. You can form your opinion based on whatever information you like. A lot of people will look, who don't follow the championship, see Sunderland in ninth and assume that this is a terrible decision and it's dreadfully unfair, and um, that's their right to do so. Um, I would draw you back to Christian Speakman's uh, comments there, um, ambition and strategy. So um, they're presumably thinking longer term than just being a few points off the playoffs and that they've got something different in mind. So, um, yes, on the surface, it does seem harsh. I find it difficult to speak objectively about Tony Mowbray as an Ipswich Town fan, and he was the um, he was in that amazing playoff winning team for Ipswich in 2000. So I do have an implicit bias towards Mogger. So I understand both sides of it, really, that uh, people would think, oh, stick with this guy, he might get you in there. But if there's a more longer-term plan, 
with perhaps a younger manager, perhaps we'll see one come in from the continent. And with a lot of the hirings and firings recently, it's young career coaches, isn't it? Even just the most recent examples of, say, a Danny Roll at Sheffield Wednesday or a Liam Manning at Bristol City. Everybody now is going for the career coach, the young guys. And unfortunately, the likes of uh, your Tony Mowbray, who's probably was the oldest manager in there after Neil Warnock went, but those guys um, seem to be um, getting passed on now and um, everyone's going for the younger guys. So that would be my my guess that um, it would be strange if Sunderland do bring in an experienced manager because that, that won't read well for what they thought of Mowbray. Um, so in conclusion, I would say Mowbray obviously did a good job because they've jumped from fifth in League One to sixth in the Championship. There was always a little bit of a sense that um, and even recently, they'd pop up in that Huddersfield game they lost recently. So they pop up like nearly three on the XG, make loads of chances and lose the game. I think maybe that was the case at Plymouth. And we've, uh, those back-to-back defeats have obviously uh, been a big factor in Sunderland pulling the trigger. So that would be my take on Tony Mowbray. Um, it will seem harsh to low information outside views. Uh, the team may be... A touch erratic, but what do you expect from a team full of young players, perhaps? But my guess is that Sunderland are going to go maybe continental and certainly for a young coach in terms of matching their player trading and what everybody else in the league is doing. Get your views in via the comments. And we are going to move on and talk about the other sacking earlier in the night. Mike Duff was kicked out from Swansea. And I have to say here, this is intangible. I've got no data uh, to back up this view. Something never, ever felt right about Mike Duff at Swansea. I know it was a big change of style. I don't mind the big change of style. Obviously, Russ Martin was the ultimate like possession-heavy control of the game by keeping the ball at all costs manager. Mike Duff, I was a very big fan of uh, from his work at Barnsley. Don't know too much in terms of uh, Cheltenham, I know he's very successful though, and got them into League One and kept them there. But last year, I thought he did a really good job at Barnsley in a crazy League One where uh, three teams were 96 points or more. I covered it from my Ipswich point of view with great detail, in fact. I thought Barnsley were excellent, high pressing, quite thrilling to watch at times as well. It was very exciting. Three centre-backs up on halfway, uh, wing-backs providing um, lots of ammunition for strikers and you know, players just leaving everything out there. And it wasn't the sort of team that was going to sit back and see how things went. They attempted to win football matches. But, and we got this even quite early in Mike Duff's reign at Swansea, where I remember, I think they'd had a a long winless streak, maybe to start his reign. And they lost at Cardiff in the big derby match. And the rumours were swelling then. And um, yeah, just never really quite... I don't know whether it was the Swansea fans that didn't take to him or he didn't ingratiate himself to the Swansea fans. It's never quite kind of do David Brent there, kind of sort of linked together. Uh, here is the statement there. Now, this is a little bit more brutal than uh, we got from Sunderland and than we normally get. I've highlighted there. This is Swans chairman, Andy Coleman. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen neither the results that we expect, nor the progress from the squad that we need. I believe it is now in the best interest of Swansea City to make a change for head coach. So just to compare to the Sunderland example there of, oh, we've got ambitions in this long-term plan and we're going to make a change now to suit that. And we wish Tony Mowbray very well and uh, we appreciate the contribution. Swansea very clearly are saying the results, given the squad they've got, are not good enough. So um, Duff, a big black mark there. Uh, for Swansea, uh, did they come down in the same season that Sunderland did? Maybe the season after. Let me just double check that while I've literally got it on the screen. Yeah, it's the season after. So 18-19. Uh, and you've got the three years of parachute payments there. You can see 10th, 6th and 4th. Uh, one of them was with Graham Potter who um, obviously ended up getting the Brighton job and the Chelsea job. I'm saying more about that. One was, uh, the other two were with Stevie Cooper, who then took Forrest 
up into the Premier League. Um, and they didn't leverage the parachute payments. Russ Martin, two seasons there, 15th and 10th. Obviously, Cooper was a bit more of a pragmatic style of um, football. Martin, as we mentioned, was the control of possession football. And Duff, well, I mean, can you even say he managed to imprint a style in the short time he was there? Because if we bring up the table, he was only there for 19 games. In terms of that recent run of form, uh, Swansea one win in eight. Only Birmingham have scored fewer points than Swans in the eight game form table. And I actually have to say, I think we can do the maths fairly easy here. If you take off those eight games and the one win in eight, I think there's a there's a four game winning streak in the middle there somewhere. And that was pretty much it for Mike Duff. Either side of that, it was relegation form, basically. And you can see Swansea there teetering. 21 points. Obviously, we've had this argument all season that the bottom four are significantly worse than everybody else. Although, Sheffield Wednesday got four points in two games and QPR have got six points in two games. So, if we do get some unlikely rise from one or more of those clubs, then you never, never know. Swansea could, if things continue in terms of one win in eight form, uh, be embroiled in a relegation battle, which you absolutely wouldn't expect from a team. I suppose there's that 15th in there, but, you know, Premier League football there for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, and then a top half championship side for all of their seasons. Although we do know what an advantage the parachute payments can be. Although I'm sure Swans fans will be in the comments saying, yeah, fair enough, Ben, you've got the parachute payments, but our owners don't bloody put any of the money in. And I would say, okay, probably a, a reasonable argument. So, Comparing again to the Mowbray sacking, because it literally happened yesterday and we were kind of talking about the two things. This feels um, much more like we've brought this guy in. It didn't work. It didn't fit um, for whatever reason, whether it's the style, whether it's the clicking with the personality and the fans there. I don't know. Again, as I said about empathy, somebody's lost their job. I don't want to perform a character assassination. And I'm sure Mowbray and Duff will both be back at some point. I think the Swansea job is a is a more difficult one than the Sunderland one, for sure, uh, in respect of Sunderland. They've got this upward momentum, whereas you can see Swansea's momentum is downwards, isn't it? It's You miss getting back to the Premier League where you've got parachute payments. You try something under Russ Martin and, you know, scratch that off and you're moving on to Mike Duff and you've already sort of pulled the trigger on on that, pulled the plug rather on that project and pulled the trigger on Mike Duff. So fairly tricky job. I do agree, though, when you look through, um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, uh, Darling came in for good money. Cabango's a good centre-back. Grimes has always been one of the better championship central midfielders. You've got the likes of Patterson in there. Yates came in for good money in terms of a goal scorer. They do tend to sell their best players. I know Piru went in the summer and we've had, um, thinking back to that Graham Potter team with McBurney and Dan James being sold, Joe Rodon, um, all of these players. In fact, quite a few of them are in the championship towards the top end of the championship. So, you know, it's the law of diminishing returns. If you don't invest, you sell your best players and don't necessarily replace them. There's only so many rabbits that can be pulled out of hats. But... Someone's going to want that Swansea job. It's a nice um, nice gig if you can get things right there. I always think if you're geographically positioned uh, in a way where you can make the home stadium a fortress and build up that local area around in terms of the support base and start winning games, you become quite a sort of formidable force. So we will see who Swansea go for. Again, reeling them off. Graham Potter, Steve Cooper, Russ Martin, Mike Duff. They've always been fairly risky in terms of their appointments. If you think Potter came in from Sweden and hadn't really managed in the in the UK before, I think I'm right in saying that Cooper hadn't done a club job and he's turned out to be a brilliant manager, hasn't he? Getting Forrest up. And uh, Martin as well had done a year at MK and they went all in on him straight away. Duff a little bit different. He's a bit more experienced, but he never managed in the championship. So we can expect uh, Swans to possibly take a bit of a risk in terms of who they're going to hire, but we will find out. Let me know your thoughts down there in the comments on 
either the sacking of Tony Mowbray or Mike Duff. Your thoughts on the job they did. Um, and the most important thing, we can talk about the past, but the most fascinating conversation now is who comes in at Sunderland, at Swansea. Remember, the Rotherham job is still open as well. And we think that Nathan Jones possibly walked away from uh, the opportunity to do that. He's a available championship manager. Gary Rower has recently been in. Obviously, John Eustace has recently been in. We can throw up a ton of names. Get your comments in. Let me just bring the table up, see if I can quickly count off the top of my head. So, Sheffield Wednesday, Rotherham, QPR, Huddersfield, Millwall, Swansea, Birmingham, Bristol City, anybody else? Sunderland. I make that nine championship clubs have now changed managers already this season. Can we get over half by the end of the season? We probably will if it goes above the um, 12 mark. But incredibly busy night last night. That's my take. Get yours in the comments. Tony Mowbray and Mike Duff out of Sunderland and Swansea. Who is going to replace them? <laughs> 